have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And I want to talk to you this morning about what to do with the problem of sin. What to do with the problem of sin. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. While you're finding your way there, I just want to say thank you for all your prayers for phase 2. Thank you for all your giving. Uh, we're rolling along. And uh, I have some good news and I have some bad news. So the good news is if you've gone to the far corner of the parking lot, uh, there's one more new parking lot that we have to install uh, in order to accommodate all the seats in phase two. And uh, the curbs are in, the base is in, we're getting ready to pave that. So that's the good news. The bad news is as soon as we pave it, we're going to tear up this parking lot here right in the middle in front of the building. So, uh, so thank you for your patience as we uh, just uh, continue on with the construction process. Uh, the building's coming together. You're going to see uh, the outside sheathing going on the building and the bricks going up very, very soon. And so um, thank you, thank you for just standing with us with that. We had a great time of prayer this last Wednesday. Uh, we, we don't have, at the very end of August, we don't have children's ministry. We don't have youth group. We take a little break for a couple of weeks. But we had a great time of prayer this last Wednesday. Uh, sweet time of worship and then we went and we walked all through phase two just praying in groups and we're going to pray again this Wednesday. There won't be children's ministry, there won't be youth group, but if you'd like to join us we'd love to have you for some prayer and a little bit of worship. All right, look with me, Romans 6 beginning in verse 1, what to do with the problem of sin. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? God forbid. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be neutralized, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves or consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. We feel you with us, Lord. Father, thank you for your powerful word. I pray that we would experience you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. Last week, we talked from Romans 5 about the superabounding grace of God. God's cure for sin is greater than the curse of sin. We talked about how where sin abounds, grace superabounds. That's literally the word that Paul made up to describe it. It's like the bacteria that bloomed in the Gulf of Mexico and gobbled up all the oil that spilled from that deep horizon well. No matter how much capacity sin has to multiply, grace always has much greater capacity to multiply. You know, those are wonderful and sublime and encouraging truths. The problem is, our actual experience in life as Christians doesn't always seem to line up with these truths. Sometimes my sin seems to be multiplying faster than God's grace is catching up with it. 
Rather than sinning less, I seem to be stuck in the same sins. Or even worse, I, I find myself sinning more than before. Paul writes about this frustration in Romans 7. He says, the things that I don't want to do are the things I end up doing. And the things I want to do, I don't do. Who will deliver me from this? You know, I think all of us can relate to that frustration. So what do we do about the problem of sin in our daily lives? Some believers in Paul's day mistakenly thought that the answer must be to outlaw sin. In other words, the answer is to go back to the law of Moses. But Paul reminds us that legalism never worked and it never will. Paul says in chapter 5 that it's literally true that rules were made to be broken. There's something about the fallen heart of mankind that whenever we see a wet paint sign, we just want to put our hand in it. Whenever we see a keep off the grass sign, we just want to go romping across that beautiful green lawn. And to compensate for that, we just keep adding more and more rules in the hopes that some will stick. You know, God gave the Jewish people 10 commandments and they turned it into 613 commandments. Jesus gave only two. No, rules are surely not the answer. On the other hand, based on everything that Paul says about grace in Romans 5, other believers have mistakenly concluded that it, the answer must be to just ignore sin. After all, if sin causes grace to multiply and brings God glory, we should just go for it. So God should be all the more glorified. At the turn of the last century, there was a Russian guru of sorts named Rasputin. He was the spiritual advisor to the Romanov family. Rasputin taught that we are saved through continuously sinning and repenting and experiencing grace. Ergo, the more vigorously we sin, the more gloriously saved we become. And Rasputin was a glorious sinner. You know, we laugh at that thought, but the truth is that there are many believers today who subconsciously share the same theology as Rasputin. We're a little indifferent to sin. Christians aren't perfect, you know, just forgiven. Some believers view the Christian life as an unchanging cycle of sinning, repenting, and being forgiven until Jesus comes back. The problem with that is that Jesus, our master, said to us, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect, and he actually meant it. You see, Christians aren't just forgiven. Christians are empowered in Christ not to go on sinning. That's good preaching right there. It's a little better preaching than you listened in that moment. <laughs> Furthermore, Paul says here at the end of Romans chapter 6 that eternal life is the result of holiness. When it comes to the problem of sin, it's like a road with two ditches on either side of it. On the one side is the ditch of legalism, rule keeping, which has never worked and it never will. On the other side of the road is the ditch of libertinism, just ignoring sin, which Jesus said is a path that does not lead to eternal life. After everything Paul has said about superabounding grace, he asked the question twice in Romans 6, should we go on sinning then? God forbid. So what do we do about the problem of sin in our daily lives? In Romans 6, Paul lays out a three-step process and I want to share it with you quickly today. What do we do with the problem of sin? Three steps from Romans chapter 6. The first is this. A truth to be embraced. A truth to be embraced. A truth to be learned and understood and believed. Paul says here that victory over sin in our daily lives begins with knowing something. He says in verse 3... Do you not know the significance of your own conversion experience? Don't you know what has happened to you, signified and sealed by your water baptism? In fact, that word know appears four times in these verses. If you still have your Bible open on your lap, you ought to underline that word know in verse 3. And you can find the other three occurrences. The first step to victory over sin is to know that you know that you know something. 
It's to learn a truth from the Bible. It's to grapple with it in prayer and meditation until you understand it. It's to receive it as fact and to believe it. Beloved, in the Christian life, it matters what you know. It matters what Bible truths you know. I would submit to you that a part of the reason that Christianity is weak and declining in America is that most believers simply don't know enough anymore. We don't know enough of the Bible. We don't know what the Bible says. We don't know what the Bible doesn't say. We don't know enough of the words of Jesus and the works of Jesus from the Gospels. That's why we easily buy into a caricature of him that's painted by those who aren't even his sheep. We don't know enough good doctrine and theology. And what we don't know is spiritually killing us. In verse 17 of chapter 6, Paul says, Thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. I want you to notice Paul's words here with me. I want you to think about them for just a minute. The form of teaching means a set body of Christian doctrine. Teachers in the early church didn't teach their own personal interpretations of Christianity. They followed a set pattern of teaching that was established by the apostles. But even more interesting, Paul doesn't say that the teaching was entrusted to us. He says that we were entrusted to the teaching. We were entrusted to the word and the word goes to work on us. Once again, we run into that Greek word paradidomai. Pastor Nick introduced it to us. It means handed over. Maybe you remember what Pastor Nick taught us in Romans chapter 1. Paul says that because mankind rejected God, God paradidomai. God handed us over to spiritual ignorance and gross sexual sin and moral depravity. But in Romans 4, Paul says that the Father, paradidomai, the Father handed over Jesus to be crucified for our sins. And when the gospel is being preached, Paul says here in Romans 6 that sinners are paradidomai. Sinners are handed over to the Word, and the Word has a powerful transforming effect on them. In Romans 10, Paul says the word is near you. It's all around you. The word is in your mouth. It's in your heart. It's the word of faith that we preach. The word has a spirit quickening effect. The word has a soul cleansing effect. The word has a heart changing effect. The word has a mind altering effect. The good kind of mind altering. The word has an emotion stabilizing effect. The word has a will changing effect. Jesus said to the disciples, now are you clean through the word that I have spoken over you. When Paul knelt down on the beach to say goodbye to the Ephesian elders for the last time, he said, now I commit you. It's the same word, paradidomai. Now I hand you over to the word of his grace, which has the ability to make you strong and sanctify you. We are handed, this is good preaching right here. We are handed over to the word and the word goes to work on us. Paul says in verse 17 of this chapter that the result is we were once slaves to sin, but now we have become obedient to Christ instead. Beloved, as this summer is winding down and we're getting ready to start the new school year, would you make a commitment this fall to know the word more and more? Would you make a commitment to read the word more? Learn more on Sundays. Take notes. Go back online. Listen to the sermons again. Listen to those parts that especially spoke to you. And maybe listen to those parts that you didn't quite catch the first time. 
Would you make a commitment to join one of our discipleship groups? Men, we're going to be here on Monday evenings in the fall learning the word together. There's another group of men that meets on Tuesday evenings in Pathways. We identify the areas of our lives where we need God's grace and then we apply the word to those areas. It's like putting Bactine on a wound until it's healed. Pastor Nick is one of the most brilliant Bible teachers I have ever heard, seriously. He's teaching on the book of Genesis every Wednesday evening at Sacred Heart across the street, beginning again in the fall. And what he's teaching from the book of Genesis spans the entire Bible. You would be absolutely amazed at the revelation God gives him. Would you make a commitment to come and learn more? You know, one of the sure signs that you've had a conversion experience with Jesus is that you're hungry to know the word like a baby is hungry for milk. Your first step to victory over sin is to know something. And listen to me, here is the truth to know. When you became a Christian, when you had your conversion moment of saving faith, when you received Christ and his salvation, something happened to you spiritually. A supernatural event took place. A spiritual transformation occurred. During your moment of faith, you became united with Christ in an intimate new relationship. In fact, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians, he says that you have become united with him so intimately that you have become one spirit with him. In Ephesians, Paul uses the picture of the one flesh bond between a husband and a wife to paint a picture of the bond that now exists between you and Christ. In a way that surpasses my ability to fully explain to you, in your new relationship with Christ, his experiences have become your experiences. Specifically, Paul says here, his experience of death and burial and resurrection has become your experience. Our friend Brian Simmons translates it this way. We have been co-crucified And co-resurrected with Christ. Spiritually speaking, we have died on the cross with him. And we have risen with him to newness of life. You know, because Paul only uses word pictures here to describe co-crucifixion and co-resurrection. It's hard to say precisely what happens to us. Even Jesus used only word pictures to describe it. Jesus used the metaphor of wind. He said, you don't know where the wind comes from. You can't see it. You don't know where it's going. But he said, you can see and you can feel its effects. Jesus was telling us that the inner work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is indescribable, but the results are clear. Paul uses the pictures of crucifixion and burial and resurrection, all of which are symbolized by our water baptism, which is the final touch on our conversion experience, not the beginning of it. It's hard to say just what the Holy Spirit does inside of us, but the clear end result is that we now have a changed relationship with sin. When I was a boy... What I was taught about these verses wasn't exactly right. I was taught that our new relationship in Christ means that our sin nature is now dead. I was taught that our desire to sin is dead. Whereas sin used to be second nature for us, it is now unnatural. I was taught that in Christ now we're dead to temptation, just like a dead man can't be tempted. Listen, you can dangle a bottle of whiskey in front of an alcoholic's corpse and he won't even lick his lips. You can pass a joint under the nose of a dead weed head and he won't even take a whiff. You can walk a pretty girl in front of a corpse and he won't even turn his head. He can't. He's dead. You know, that teaching worked great for me for a couple of years and then I became an adolescent. And then I became an adult. And I discovered that I was not, in fact, a corpse. I discovered that I was not dead to temptation and that I was indeed very capable of sinning. 
Maybe you've heard the same kind of teaching from these verses. And I don't mean any disrespect to our teachers in Christ, but here's why that teaching doesn't work. First of all, it doesn't fit the rest of Paul's words. If Paul tells us in one breath that we're dead to temptation, why would he command us in the next breath not to give in to temptation? And secondly, it doesn't line up with our Christian experience. Since I found that I wasn't dead to temptation like a corpse, it made me wonder whether or not I was really in Christ, but I knew I was in Christ. Here's what Paul does not mean in Romans 6. He does not mean that we are now no longer capable of sinning. He does not mean that we are impervious to temptation. He does not mean that we no longer experience bodily appetites that can lead us to sin if we don't keep them in check. Sin and our ability to commit it are very much alive and well as we all well know. Here's what Paul does mean. In Christ, there has been a fundamental change in our relationship to sin. Sin is no longer our master. Sin no longer has a claim on us and no longer has power over us. You see, each of us are born into a spiritual state called in Adam. We are not only descendants of Adam biologically, we are also descendants of Adam spiritually. But when we have that moment of saving faith, we undergo a change in spiritual state. We go from being in Adam to being in Christ. In Adam Sin, we studied it last week in Romans 5. In Adam, sin has dominion over us. Sin is our master. But in Christ, we are set free from that. You see, Christ's experience on the cross becomes our experience. The penalty for our sin is paid in full. And so sin loses its claim on us. Paul says our old self is crucified. And our body of sin is neutralized. That means that our old way of life before Jesus that was dominated by sin is finished now. That's why Jesus said it is finished. And Christ's experience of resurrection becomes our experience so that we can live in newness of life. Everybody look at me. You don't have to understand all the mechanics of it. In fact, you cannot. Paul wrote that it's going to take ages in eternity for God to unravel all the mysteries of his grace to us. Here's what you do have to know. When you had your moment of saving faith, something happened to you. Previously, you were powerless against sin, but now you are free. Are you still tempted? Yes. Do you still have bodily desires? Yes. Are you still capable of sinning? Yes. But do you have strength in Christ to withstand temptation? Yes. Do you have strength in Christ to discipline your body? Yes. Do you have strength in Christ not to sin? Yes. The first step to victory is to know this truth. What to do with the problem of sin? Three steps. A truth to be embraced. Secondly, a conclusion to be applied daily. A conclusion to be applied daily. Once we know something, it leads us to conclusions that we have to apply to our life every day. Paul says in verse 11, now that you know that you have been co-crucified and co-resurrected with Christ, consider, or maybe your version says count or reckon, consider yourself in verse 11 Dead to God, dead to sin, but alive to God. If you have your Bibles open, you ought to underline that word consider or that word count in verse 11. If you're taking notes, you should write down that word consider in bold letters. You should underline it a few times. A few things to consider about this word consider. First of all, consider comes from the root word for logic. It means to think something through. It means to chew on it. For a while, as it were. It means to meditate on it, reflect on it. It means to grapple with it and draw some conclusions that direct your decisions. Second, this word consider means to apply something. Actually, it's a banking word. 
that means to apply a deposit to somebody's account. So this word consider, it means apply logic. Third thing to know about this word consider in verse 11 is that it is in a continuous tense. So Paul is saying apply this Bible logic continuously. Apply this daily to your life. Now we know something. We know that we have been co-crucified and co-resurrected with Christ. We don't understand all the mechanics of it, but we do know that it means that our relationship to sin has been changed. We do know that sin is no longer our master. We do know that we have the power now not to sin that we did not previously have. So let's think through the meaning of this and let's apply some Bible logic to our daily living. My co-crucifixion and co-resurrection with Christ means that I have, don't have to succumb to sin today. I have the strength in Christ not to sin today. And not only do I have the strength not to sin, I have the power to do what pleases, to, pleases God today. What might happen if we started making that a daily confession? What might happen if we took what we know from Romans 6 and we started applying the conclusions of it to our daily life in the form of a confession? Well, what if we started each new day applying these truths? What if we started each new day by confessing, I have been co-crucified with Christ? The penalty for my sin has been paid in full. Sin no longer has a claim on me. Sin no longer has power over me. Sin is no longer my master. I am free not to sin today. What have we started confessing? I have been co-resurrected with Christ. I am free to walk in newness of life today. I am free to do what pleases God today. What if we started naming the sins that we're struggling with right now and we started telling those sins they have no power over us today. Not today. There's a woman on the internet. She's a, a YouTube sensation. Her house was burning down, her apartment building, and she ran out with her children. They interviewed her and she said to the fire, not today. You're not going to get me today. What happened if we started each day saying alcohol, not today. Pills, not today. Smokes, not today. Porn, not today. Envy, not today. Coveting, not today. Anger, not today. Profanity, not today. Bitterness, not today. Self-pity and self-loathing, not today. I want you to stand up with me if you would. We're going to do a little, we're going to do a little confession practice right now. What would happen if we, if we started applying? You know what? At the end of the day, we get down and we say, oh, God, I'm sorry for everything, all the ways I blew it today. What happened if we started the day by making it? You know, listen to me. You don't have to ask God to give you something he's already given you. You just have to remind yourself that he already gave it to you, and it's yours. So we're going to do a little confession practice. I'm going to lead. I want you to follow after me, and let's just apply some of this Bible logic to our life by confessing it. I'll lead. You follow. I have been co-crucified with Christ. I have been co-crucified with Christ. Oh, you know what? The A30 crowd. All the old people came to A30, and they shouted you down. You're like twice as many people and you're half their age. And they, they like, come on, you didn't scare the devil one bit. He's, he's not convinced, all right? Let's try it again. I have been co-crucified with Christ. I have been co-crucified with Christ. The penalty for my sin has been paid in full. The penalty for my sin has been paid in full. Sin no longer has any claim on me. Sin has no power over me. Sin is no longer my master. Sin is no longer my master. I am free not to sin today. I am free not to sin today. I have been co-resurrected with Christ. I have been co-resurrected with Christ. I am free to walk in newness of life today. I am free to walk in newness of life today. I am free to do what pleases God today. I am free to do what pleases God today. Sin, sin. not today. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name, 
Oh, come on, give the Lord a hand, would you? You can be seated. What might happen if we started applying that logic through a daily confession? And maybe even a symbol could be a helpful reminder throughout the day. Maybe a cross. Listen, it's not a lucky charm, it's not a talisman, but maybe a cross around your neck or somewhere in front of your eyes might help you to remind you through the day that you have been co-crucified and co-resurrected with Christ. What to do with the problem of sin? Three steps from Romans 6. A truth to be embraced, a conclusion to be applied daily, and finally this, an offering to be made continually. An offering to be made continually. How do we get victory over sin? Paul lays out three steps. Know something. Apply the logic of it daily. And finally, offer yourself to God instead of to sin. How do we offer ourselves to God? There's two parts to it. First of all, Paul says we offer ourselves to God by not surrendering to sin. Paul uses military language in these verses. That word translated offer is the word surrender. Do not surrender the parts of your body as weapons of unrighteousness is what it actually says. You see, when you give in to sin, you take your armored Humvee with the mounted M2 machine gun on top of it and you put it in the hands of ISIS. When you give in to sin, you take your rocket propelled grenade launcher and you put it in the hands of ISIS. You take the weapons that God has issued to you to destroy your enemy and you hand them over to the enemy to destroy you. We're not dead to temptation nor to desires that can lead us to sin, but we don't have to surrender to them either. We don't have to say yes. We have the strength in Christ to just say no. Paul says very simply here, do not let sin in. Again, it's just in that continuous tense. Don't let sin in today. Don't let sin in tomorrow. Don't let sin in the next day or the next day or the next day. You have the strength in Christ to say no. How do we offer ourselves to God? First, by not surrendering to sin. And second, we offer ourselves to God by offering our bodies as weapons of righteousness. From our friends at Pathways, I learned something valuable about overcoming temptation. It's called change a thought, move a muscle. If you're sitting there on the couch at 10 o'clock at night, and you're tempted to eat that whole pint of Ben and Jerry's that's calling you from the freezer. Change your thought and move a muscle. Get up and do something. Call a friend. Go clean your closet. It needs to be cleaned. Read a book. Pray. Here's an idea. Go to bed and get some sleep. Change your thought and move a muscle. And Paul is telling us to do the same thing. He says, don't surrender to sin, but instead, get up and do something. Get up and offer yourself to God instead. What would happen if, rather than surrendering our eyes and our ears and our minds to the internet and the television, we got up and offered them to God instead? What if we offered ourselves to men's Bible study on Monday nights instead? What if we offered ourselves to pathways on Tuesday nights or Thursday mornings instead? What if we offered ourselves to serving with the boys on Wednesday evening and the girls or, or working with youth group instead? What if we got involved with prayer ministry or missions or nursing home ministry? Or what if we started a new ministry that doesn't exist to meet a need that does exist? What if we started using our God-given weapons against the enemy and then he couldn't use them against us. What to do about the problem of sin? Three steps, a truth to embrace, a conclusion to confess daily, and an offering to make continually. Let me close with this. The English pastor and author, Stuart Briscoe, shares a story that I think helps us to just picture 
our new relationship to sin. During the Korean War, he was drafted into the Royal Marines. He said the head of his unit was a sergeant major who was so tough that he made the toughest Marines cry. Stuart said he didn't realize how dominant this man had become in his life until the day that he was discharged from the Marines. He received his honorable discharge papers and he left the base commanding office and he was standing outside trying to figure out what to do next. And he said he was leaning against the wall with his foot up behind him and he slipped his hand in his pocket and he was chewing a piece of gum. All of a sudden, the sergeant major came barreling around the corner and Stuart said when he saw him, he immediately snapped to attention because he was so used to being barked at by this guy continuously. But the sergeant major just walked past him and smirked. Stuart wrote, Then I realized that I had died to him. He and I no longer had a relationship. Oh, he was not dead, and neither was I, but as far as his domination of my life was concerned, it was now a matter of history. So I did some reckoning, and I decided not to yield to his tyranny anymore. I smiled back at him. I leaned back against the wall. I put my hand back in my pocket and took a big chaw on my gum, and there was nothing he could do about it. Beloved, you have been co-crucified and co-resurrected with Christ. You are no longer in service to sin. You're still alive and sin is still alive, but the two of you no longer have a relationship. Sin no longer has dominion over you. You are dead to sin and you are alive to God. Know this truth. Confess it daily and offer yourself to God continually. Will you stand on your feet? Give Jesus a great big praise. Come on, give Jesus the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.